Okay, welcome to notes at number 25, where we'll talk about the FFT algorithm. This is <clears throat> the algorithm that actually makes doing numerical DFT computation uh, amazingly efficient. And I think you could almost safely say that without the FFT algorithm, uh, we probably wouldn't be seeing the widespread application of DSP um, in, in real-world uh, applications. Because um, as fast as our computers get, um, we'll see that the the DFT computed directly is uh, mighty slow, um, and the FFT is much much faster, which allows us to do longer uh, blocks of FFT processing um, in fairly short order. So um, I'm going. We're going to look at. The, uh, two different ways of developing the FFT algorithm. One is just a pretty straightforward uh, kind of ad hoc way, and uh, I'll provide a, uh, a write-up that I'll post on Blackboard for that. Uh, or, well, I may I may put it on my on my open web page. We'll we'll see. Um, uh, I'll let you know. Uh, and in the next note set, note set number 26, we'll look at a more systematic development of the FFT algorithm that is much more general, um, but doesn't necessarily provide as much insight into how, uh, how it really works. So seeing both of the approaches um, really gives you um, the ability to kind of see the, the real nature of how we get this savings and then also have the tools that allow you to understand and develop, uh, you know, the more um, the more general approaches. All right, let's move on. Next slide. Um, so, uh, just to set the stage, let's look at um, how how much computation one would have to do to compute the DFT in the obvious direct way. And, and that's really what we're doing. We're not really doing anything other than finding a clever way of, of um, doing the, the computations in a, uh, in a more efficient way that kind of shares computations. Um, but let's just look at the DFT. So, so up at the top here, we have written out our DFT that we're going to compute for k equal from 0 out to n minus 1. So we need to compute n of those numbers. Um, and uh, so therefore, um, we should look at however many computations we have to do uh, in this summation. We will have to do um, n times. So we're going to assume that we've already got these things pre-computed. So we've got the, the appropriate complex numbers um, stored, computed and stored somewhere. So, so given that, uh, once we get our data, we know, you know, kind of a priori that we're going to do an endpoint DFT. So we have those complex numbers stored. And so uh, we've got n pieces of data, which will have to get multiplied by n... Uh, complex numbers, so we'll need to do one complex multiply to compute each term, and since there's n terms, we'll need a total of n complex multiplies for each sum, uh, and we'll also need, once we form those n multiple, uh, multiplies, we have n products that we'll have to add together, um, so that would require n minus 1 complex additions. Um, and so that just computes the sum once, and we need to compute that n times. Uh, so these n complex multiplies will be done n times, so we'll have n squared complex multiplies, and the n minus 1 additions to make one sum will have to be done n times, so we'll have n times n minus 1 complex additions, which for a large n, uh, we might as well just call that n squared as well. So we've got n squared complex multiplies, and we've got n squared complex additions. And this is what uh, computer scientists call big O n squared, or order n squared. So we would say that the direct DFT computation is order n squared in complexity. That means if we double the number of data points, 
the amount of complexity will quadruple. Um, okay, so um, what we'll see is that um, the standard FFT algorithm uh, will require, on, on the order of n over 2, log 2n complex multiplies, and n over 2 log 2n complex additions. Um, and so even though we have an n over 2 here, uh, when we talk about orders of things, you ignore any um, constant out in front that doesn't change with n. So that one-half factor would be ignored, and we would say that this is order n log n. And you know, the, uh, we don't even really have to say log 2 um, because we can convert any log base into another log base with an appropriate constant out in front. So, um, so that kind of gets handled in the, in, in the order bit. So we say order n log n. Um, and so you might wonder, you know, how much of a savings is order n squared versus order n log n? Um, and that's a good question. And so here is a, a, a picture uh, where um, I'm looking at the number of complex multiplies, um, just just the number of complex multiplies that we just looked at on the previous page, the equation for doing the DFT directly, and then the equation for doing the FFT directly, uh, versus N, and we can see that as N goes up, they both increase, um, but we can see how much slower the FFT increases than the DFT, but notice this is on a log scale, um, so this is um, significant. So let's take a look at this. Suppose we're going to do uh, a length 1000 uh, point DFT, which is really, you know, kind of a typical length. It's not real short, it's not real long, um, and we can see that we're going uh, just below 10 to the 4th for the FFT versus 10 to the 6th um, for, uh, for the DFT direct. And uh, so we, we say that's uh, slightly more than two orders of magnitude, an order of magnitude being um, a change of one power of 10, which means a factor of 10. So we're talking about um, the FFT is more than 100 times less complexity um, than, than the DFT uh, at, at n equal to 1,000. For n equal to 10,000, so we are now going up an order of magnitude on n, and we see that we are now 1, 2, 3 orders of magnitude. Um, so that means a, a factor of 1,000. So um, if, if we could do the FFT, and this is just rough, if the FFT implemented this way took one millisecond to do, uh, the DFT would take one second to do that, um, you know, 1,000 times as long. Uh, so this is a significant savings, and you, you see that the, the savings grows as we go higher and higher and higher. Um, so it's, it's not just that it's always 1,000 times better. If we go up to uh, 100,000, um, know, it's not quite going up always in order, but um, we can see if we extend this uh, a little bit farther, we are at 1, 2, 3, about 4 orders of magnitude. So we, we get about an order of magnitude, roughly, uh, more improvement from the FFT uh, for every order of magnitude that we go up. And, and that's kind of characteristic of n log n uh, behavior versus n squared behavior. Um, and so, uh, so this is significant. And uh, like I said, without the FFT um, efficiencies, if, if that had never been discovered or if the DFT had a structure that did not lend itself to more efficient computation, uh, we would not be seeing the things that we're able to do today, uh, like MP3 coding and decoding um, would, would not really be achievable in real time. So let's motivate um, what we're really doing here. Um, how, how is it that we're able to take a DFT, which has an equation that tells us this is how to compute it, 
uh, and somehow do the same, uh, get the same final results, but with less computation. It all has to do with kind of the structure that's inherent in the computation and how we break that structure down. Um, and so I'll tell a little story about uh, Carl Gauss, who one of the most famous mathematicians, and I'm not sure I have the exact details of the story right. I've, I've heard it a couple different ways, and I've actually even heard that it never even really happened, but, you know, I mean, who knows? That was hundreds of years ago. Um, but the story tells a nice little story. <laughs> no kidding. Um, but it, it makes a nice point that uh, comes in handy when you're trying to explain how you find efficiencies. Um, so basically the story goes something like this. The, the, the details of how and why th this assignment was given uh, differ. But um, basically, uh, you know, the teacher tells uh, the students to add the numbers from 1 to 100. Now, one version of the story is that the teacher does this um, to, uh, to punish Gauss and, and uh, you know, kind of keep him busy because Gauss was always pestering the math, the math teacher. Um, anyway... Um, you know, the typical person would just start adding 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, and that's a lot of work, um, and it would take a lot of time, and you, and you got to basically do 99 additions. Um, and what Gauss realized was that if we start from the outside and work in, so we take 100, or uh, 1 plus 100, we get 101, and if we take 2 plus 99, we get 101, and 3 plus 98, and we get 101, and so on, and so on, and so on. Uh, and so there's, there's 55 uh, such sums uh, this way, and so if we do these 55 sums uh, and, and multiply 55 times 101, uh, we'll, we'll actually get um, uh, 50, 50, 5,050 is, is the answer. Uh, now I'm starting to, it's not really 55 sums, it should be 50 sums. Um, so I, I, I think that's an error in my notes. I'll have to try to correct those. Um, but so the answer is, is, uh, is 5,050, and what did we have to do? We really had to do one sum and one multiplication to, to get that, rather than doing um, 99 um, additions. So this is the kind of structure, or, or you know, illustrates the kind of way that we can look at a problem, and there's a hard way to compute it, and there's an efficient way to compute it. Um, for, for many problems. And it turns out for the DFT um, that that is exactly the case. So um, before we go any further, um, you know, just like Gauss uh, used two-point sums to simplify his 100-point sum problem, uh, the FFT boils down to looking at two-point DFT. So the similarity uh, is actually uh, a lot more so than you might think between uh, all of this. And, uh, and it's also rumored, actually, that... Uh, I, don't, I, don't think, I think it's actually more than a rumor. I think that Gauss actually invented the, the FFT algorithm uh, when he was doing Fourier analysis of um, uh, orbits, when he was trying to solve his orbits. Um, so I believe that somebody looked back in the history and, and discovered that as well. So, and maybe he figured that out because of this uh, 100 point sum trick that he did. Anyway, uh, we'll look at a two point DFT because it will be a fundamental building block uh, that we'll be using. So if we let capital N be two, we're going to need to do this sum here from uh, N equals zero out to one. And we'll need to do this um, twice. Uh, and so we can write out explicitly what this thing looks like, um, and, we, and we have that here. So uh, capital X of 0 uh, is just little x of 0 times e to the plus j 0 times 0. So this becomes 1. And then we have e to the minus j pi 0 times 1, and that becomes 1. So we just have the sum of x0 plus x1. Uh, and then 
capital X of 1 is X of 0 times e to the minus j pi uh, 1 times 0. So um, this becomes uh, 1. And then we have e to the minus j pi 1 times 1. So that's e to the minus j pi, uh, and that becomes minus 1. Uh, so this, this part can go away, and we can change the positive sign to a negative sign. And so uh, basically a two-point DFT boils down to um, add the two values together. That's one of the uh, DFT points. Uh, and subtract the values, and that and that's the other one. So we can write that um, in a little block diagram form. So the the nature of these is a little bit different than what we uh, have used in block diagrams for our discrete time systems. Um, but the basic idea is the same. Um, so we represent uh, with dots. Anytime we see a dot with two things coming in and, and uh, or at least two things coming in and one thing going out, uh, it's a summation. Uh, so the two things going in will get added together uh, to create the output. And if we put a number next to a, a line, it means a multiplier. So we don't have an explicit symbol uh, for, for, uh, to represent the multiplier. Um, so this uh, simple diagram here, um, shows us uh, how to uh, envision doing a two-point DFT. And so this has a, a very uh, simple structure to visualize, and, and we'll use that structure over and over again. Um, and in fact, you can kind of look at this and see two wings, um, and so this kind of structure uh, is, is called a butterfly structure, and we'll, we'll see... Um, a more formalized version of, of the full butterfly structure that we use for FFTs in, in just a little bit. So if we go on to the next slide here, um, we can see here that uh, uh, what we're going to do is, is come up with a, a development for the FFT, and we're looking at a very specific form which will be called Radix 2, decimate in time, and, and we'll explain what each of those means. So radix 2 basically means that um, we're, we're relying on the n that we're, um, the number of samples that we're processing, and this would be including zero padding. So if we're, if we're doing zero padding, we're talking about the, the length that includes the amount of zero padding. So the length of our DFT is a power of 2. So that's where the radix 2 comes from. Uh, and the decimate in time uh, will come from how we break this down. And, and I'll point that out as we, we get down there. So here's our DFT equation for k equals 0 out to n minus 1. And we're just using this commonly defined w sub n to be e to the minus j 2 pi over n. So whatever number shows up here is what we divide 2 pi by um, to get that number. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is take this sum and break it down into um, uh, two different shorter um, summations. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the even index samples and we're going to look at the odd index samples. Um, and then we'll manipulate this and reinterpret this as two half-size DFTs. So, um, so all I'm doing is I'm just breaking this sum down into two parts instead of going, uh, you know, n equal to 0, n equal to 1, n equal to 2. I'm going to uh, take all the even indexed um, samples. Now, my sum here is actually indexed 0, 1, 2, 3, but I'm, I'm playing a trick. It's as if I'm really just indexing, uh, you know, when, when n is equal to 0, I get 0. When n is equal to 1, I get 2. 2, I get 4, and so on. So it really is like I'm grabbing uh, just the even indexed um, points. And notice that I've put a 2n up here so that I am also um, getting the proper value of that uh, for my even indexed. And then here I'm doing the same trick. 2n plus 1 gives me all the odd uh, indexed 
elements. And again, I use the 2n plus 1 up there so that uh, when I grab, say, x3, I'll have a n equal to 3 up there as well. Um, so this is just a simple step of breaking this down into uh, two parts. So taking every other term of this sum and, and putting them uh, on one side or the other of, of this. Um, and so now the next step is really not terribly difficult. Uh, I'm just renaming. So I'm saying call this sequence x sub e, call this sequence x sub o. Uh, so e standing for even, o standing for odd. And that's uh, one thing that I've done in that step. The other major thing that I've done in that step is to look at uh, the structure for the W term in the second summation on the first line. So if I look at this here, I can see, remember this is just exponential property, so I can break that into uh, the WN K to N, and that stays here, and then a WN K times the 1 uh, just gives me w sub n k, and I pull that out in front since it has no dependence on little n. Um, so now I see that what I have is two summations that look remarkably similar to each other. Um, and I'm going to do one last step here so that I can interpret what those summations actually are. So right now they don't really look precisely like DFTs, and the reason they don't look like DFTs is that my sum is going only over n over 2 terms, but I have a w sub n, whereas to make that an actual n over 2 point DFT, I should have a w n over 2, and I should have just kn up at the top. So let's play a trick here. If we look carefully at how the w sub n is defined, Suppose I were to put a um, divide by 2 here, so I have w sub n over 2, that would mean I would have to put a divide by 2 here, but 2 pi over n over 2 means I can pull the 2 up into the, into the numerator of that. So that's equivalent to just putting an additional 2 right in there. Um, and so notice that that is actually what I have here, right? I've got um, a, a 2 up there. So I can effectively take that 2 and um, bring it down uh, underneath n. So that's what I do. I take all of this and it gets changed to this. The, the 2 moves from the exponent down into the, the subscript. Um, and, and we, you know, following the rules that we found up, up there. Now when we look at this we go, aha, I really do now have uh, n over 2 point DFT. So this is an n over 2 point DFT. Um, this is an n over 2 point DFT. Um, now the trick here, this is not all that obvious, since this is an n over 2 point DFT Technically, that would only be evaluated for k out to n over 2 minus 1. And remember, since n is a power of 2, um, we, we know that we can divide n by 2, and, and nothing bad happens. We end up with an integer. Um, but technically, k, since this is an n over 2 point DFT, should only go out to n over 2. But remember that... Um, if we were to try to evaluate it at points of k further, it's going to be periodic. So this will be, uh, if we go to the, the, the next uh, n over 2 points beyond k equal to n over 2 minus 1, we're just going to be repeating through those, those numbers. Um, so we can exploit that, that periodic nature. Um, so that's what we're saying down here. Each n over 2 point DFT uh, really only needs to be evaluated over that range, and then you exploit the periodic nature. So when we're evaluating this at the higher points here, we're really just going back and grabbing the ones that we evaluated uh, in the first uh, n over 2 points 
that we computed here. Now notice this term here uh, is, is not periodic with n over 2. Um, that's periodic with period n. So that's what um, makes the result that we get here different on the second half of k than in the first half. So on each of these two halves, the two sums are actually identical to each other, um, but how we'll combine those uh, will be um, different because the, the w uh, sub k value is, is uh, the w sub n k value is different. Okay, so that's similar to, you know, taking x of 0 in a, in a two-point DFT, x of 0 uh, plus 1, x of 0 minus x of 1. So uh, we have the, you know, the same value here and here, same value here and here, but we end up getting something different because they get combined differently. Same kind of thing. All right, let's move on to the next page here. Uh, this diagram just shows an eight-point DFT broken up the way we just talked about. Um, so uh, we start off with an eight-point DFT, and we break it down into two four-point DFTs. Um, and you can see how we exploit that, that periodic nature. Um, so if we're computing x of zero, notice that we use this number and this number to do that. Uh, and then, uh, so, then when we get up to k equal to 4, we have to cycle back. So we, you know, as we've gone through these, we've, we've gone through those uh, and those. Then we, we run out of those. We have to cycle back up. To get x of 4, we're going to cycle back up and reuse this and reuse this, but notice that what we multiply by is different in each case. Here we multiply by w sub 8 of 0. Here we multiply by w sub 8 of 4. Um, and so that's, that's how this structure works. And so, um, again, we're noticing this structure, uh, this kind of butterfly-shaped structure that comes out of this, uh, and it looks sort of like a two-point uh, DFT. Not quite, and, um, but we'll, we'll get it there uh, very soon. Um, and so we've got these four-point uh, DFTs here, and, and we'll see soon that the next step is to say, well, I broke an eight-point DFT down into two four-point DFTs. I can break two four-point DFTs down into two two-point DFTs. And we would just... You know, if we started with more than eight points, we would keep doing that um, breaking down uh, and end up with a bunch of stages. And we'll see that each one of those stages basically boils down to doing a bunch of two-point DFTs. So anyway, we identify this structure here. So each one of these uh, little diagrams that I have color-coded up here, the red one, the blue one, the green one, the black one, they all have this exact same structure. Um, and so... Um, part of the uh, efficiency of a DFT is um, focusing on fixing some of the inefficiencies in this little butterfly structure. So let's take a look at where that inherent structure is. And it's very similar to that plus and minus addition and subtraction structure that we saw in the two-point um, DFT. So if, if you looked carefully at what we were just looking at, we had something where um, we had a number plus n over 2. So in this case, n is equal to 8. And noticing that if we take, um, if we take Wn3 plus n over 2, that we get effectively negative Wn over 3. So Wn over 3 and Wn7 are going to be negatives of each other. And in fact, anything that is uh, on opposite sides will be negatives of each other. So Wn1, Wn5, 
those are going to be negatives of each other. And WN0, WN4, those will be negatives of each other. Um, and, and that's just basically saying that anything, uh, you know, to flip something around 180 degrees on, on the complex plane is just multiplying by, an, uh, by negative 1. And so what that means is that we, we don't need all of that structure. Um, we can replace uh, some of these things by, by negatives uh, of, of things that exist somewhere else. And then we can factor out that common term uh, and, and multiply by that once. And so here's, here's how we do that. So the structure that we just saw, um, at every one of those little butterfly structures had something multiplying here and had something multiplying here. And the thing that was here had an n plus 2 added to the exponent compared to the thing that was there. So every one of them had that structure. You can go back and check that um, and, and, and see that every one of them had that structure. But now using this uh, structure around the unit circle that we just saw, we can say that, well, adding, plus, uh, adding n over 2 can be done just by negating. So now notice that we have WNM and negative WNM. Well, why multiply by that thing twice? We'd be multiplying once along this line and once along this line. Um, we can factor that W sub NM out in front and leave the negative sign behind. So, uh, so this thing and this thing get pulled out here um, because input number two is the thing that gets hit, right? Input number two gets hit by that. Input number two gets hit by that. Um, so we pull it out and we do input number two times that once. And then when that product goes down this channel, nothing happens to it other than being added. And when it comes down this channel, it gets multiplied by minus one. Well, hey, multiplication by minus one is not really multiplication at all. It's flipping a sign bit. That's it. And that's easy to do. You just flip the sign bit. Um, so there's really no complexity at all in changing um, the sign. It's not like doing multiplication, which requires a fair amount of, of computation. So we don't even really have to count sign changes uh, in our complexity. Um, we only need to, com uh, to account for... Um, multiplications and additions, but not, not sign changes. So this thing that we pulled out in front, this W sub N of M, um, is uh, often called the twiddle factor in some books, and in other books it's called the phase factor. I mean, it is a phase factor. Uh, the early people who developed this thing had a good sense of humor, and they called it the twiddle factor. Um, okay, so this butterfly structure, especially this improved form of the butterfly structure, is something that we will be um, exploring in our development here. So now uh, our ne our, the next step is we apply this improved form of the butterfly here. And this is key. What we notice is that if we just look to the right of where those twiddle factors get applied, um, the, the red structure there is a two-point DFT. Uh, the blue structure is a two-point DFT. The green is two-point DFT. The black is a two-point DFT. So, um, so basically what we're seeing is that we can take uh, an eight-point DFT, break it down into computing two four-point DFTs, whose results are then... Uh, twiddle factors are applied to one of those two four-point DFTs and not the other one, and then we combine the like-indexed terms uh, through two-point DFTs, um, and, and that's the bottom line. Um, now, we have a four-point DFT, we have a four-point DFT, so we can break this down into two two-point DFTs, using the same ideas, and we can break the four point DF, the other four-point DFT down into two two-point DFTs using exactly the same ideas. And because we started with um, a power of two for our n, uh, we can keep doing this until we get down to um, 
just left with just two point DFTs. Um, and uh, it may take many stages to do that. Um, so in fact, it'll take V stages to do that. Um, and so that's basically how we go about doing that. So we're breaking it down into these um, stages, and then each stage we're taking advantage of this uh, cost savings. Uh, we're reducing the number of multiplications by pulling the twiddle factors out in front and leaving minus signs behind. Um, and so that's really uh, key to seeing how this thing works. Um, and the reason that we call this a decimation in time, remember we split this um, by breaking our, our uh, DFT sum down into um, odds and even on the time samples. So that's where the decimation in time comes from. Uh, the term decimation is used elsewhere in, in DSP, um, for, uh, you know, kind of different ideas, but, uh, um, so don't get confused there. All right, let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, if we continue this for our example n equal to 8, um, we'll get something that looks like this. So, because uh, 8 is 2 to the 3, we'll have three stages. So here's the, uh, the butterfly structure that we just saw, and, and remember, we had, we had this as um, a uh, four-point DFT, and we had this as a four-point DFT, and we've now broken it down into um, you know, two more stages. Um, and so looking at this, we now see uh, the full structure for an eight-point FFT. Now remember, I mean, we're not really interested in doing eight-point FFTs. We're interested in doing like, you know, 4,096, uh, you know, 8,192, 16,384, uh, or more, uh, you know, 32,768. Um, those are the kinds of sizes of FFTs that, that we typically um, are interested in doing. Um, so this is, our, this is our structure. We see that we have three different stages, and notice that each stage basically consists of a bunch of different uh, well, f four uh, two-point DFTs with appropriate placements of of twiddle factors. So you can see all the uh, the twiddle factors here. Um, you can see twiddle factors here and here and here, 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 and here. Um, and so uh, these terms down at the bottom uh, are things that I explain in more detail in. Um, in the uh, uh, write-up that I'll post, um, but uh, basically I'll, I'll just allude to them a little bit here. Um, basically, we've got the butterfly step is equal to one. The butterfly span um, uh, is a little easier to see. So the butterfly span here is one. The butterfly span here is two, and the butterfly span here is four. Um, and then our, our block step, well, I, I'm not going to go into the details of this. It's uh, quite a bit easier to explain it in, um, in the paper, uh, the, 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 the reading that I'll, that I'll post. But um, there, there's definitely a structure that you can see here. The, uh, the butterfly step stays the same across all the stages. The butterfly span uh, goes down by factor of two. The, uh, the block step goes down by uh, a, a factor of of two each time, um, and, and you know the block step is how far we jump from from each of these structures. So here we just have one block, and it's a block of eight. So you know even though we're not really stepping to another block, our block step is eight. Um, here, let me get rid of that stuff. Uh, hold on just a second. Um, here, we've got this as a block and this as a block. And um, our block step is four. So um, we're, I'm, I'm calling it block. Uh, yeah, block step is four uh, from here to, to here. And then up here, we've got a block, a block, a block, and a block. 
And so our block step is, is two uh, as we step through these different blocks. So again, in, in the reading, I go into more detail of this, and, and by understanding that structure, you can figure out how to do this for, for any n. Um, all right, so let's move to the slide. Um, and we need to be able to figure out what our twiddle factors are, and, and there's uh, some uh, rationale and simple way to figure out how to do that as well. Um, so we've got our first stage twiddle factors, our second stage twiddle factors, and our third stage twiddle factors. Um, and so basically the first stage twiddle factors will always just be just this number, um, which, is, which is one. So on the first stage, we don't really have any explicit twiddle factors at, at all. Um, and then we can take, uh, uh, we jump to uh, 2 pi divided by 4, and then 2 pi divided by 8. And if we had more uh, stages, uh, because we had an n, a longer uh, n, we would then go to 2 pi over 16 and, and, and so forth. So we're always um, going up. Uh, you know, reducing the, 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 the step size here. And again, I give more detail in, in the write-up as to how that actually works. Um, the last thing that we want to take a look at here is that if you look at um, the, the form of the FFT that we end up with because of the way we developed it by splitting into evens and odds, and then remember in the next stage, those evens will be split into their own evens and odds, and the odds will be split into their own evens and odds. And these are, um, you know, uh, even within their sequence. So, you know, we end up with 0, 2, 4, 6. Um, and, and so then uh, we would split those into, we would renumber those by, you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and use those re-indexed numbers to determine which ones are odds and evens. So if you followed through what we did, uh, we ended up, uh, if you looked at the sequence of the inputs to our 8-point FFT algorithm, they actually showed up in this order. So that first 2-point um, FFT took in uh, index 0 and index 4. Then the next 2-point DF, DFT took in index 2 and 6, uh, and then the next one was index 1 and 5, and the next one was index 3 and 7. Um, so uh, it seems like uh, it might be difficult to figure out what order we need to put these things in uh, if we have a, a longer FFT, and it seems like we might have to walk our way backwards as far as we need to go, keeping track of all this. But it turns out uh, and again, I give a little more detail on this in the reading, that um, we can determine this by just using what's called bit-reversed order. So um, if we take our 8, for our n equal to 8 case, we take our 8 uh, decimal uh, indices, and we write them out in their binary form, we can find the correct order for our 8-point FFT by just doing bit reversal. So the first one, 0, 0, 0, you reverse that, you still get 0, 0, 0. But the next one, 0, 0, 1, you reverse that, you get 1, 0, 0, and that gives you the 4 that you need over here. Then you take 0, 1, 0, you bit reverse that, which is really no change at all, and so you get 0, 1, 0, which is 2. Then you've got 0, 1, 1, bit reverse that, you get 1, 1, 0, which turns out to be 6. Um, and so this continues on like that, uh, and these comments over here are showing that, you know, this really just corresponds to some swaps, um, but really the, the big idea is doing this, this bit reversal. Um, so there are, um, built into the FFT algorithms in software or hardware, um, you know, ways to compute these, um, bit reversed, uh, indexings. All right, moving on. Um, let's, now that we've got a, a way of figuring out what our FFT looks like, regardless of the size, 
um, every stage is going to be um, doing a bunch of these two-point uh, FFTs, two-point DFTs, plus uh, dealing with the twiddle factor. So um, this is the fundamental building block. We just keep doing that computation over and over and over. Very much like Gauss, presumably, just kept doing the same computation of adding uh, two numbers from the outside over and over and over. Um, so to figure out the total FFT complexity, we just need to figure out what's the complexity of this thing and how many times do I do this? So I'm going to uh, bring in input number one, input number two, whatever those are, uh, you know, from wherever this ends up being in my stage. Input number two must get multiplied by a complex number. Uh, so we end up with one complex multiply. That's the only multiplication that has to happen in this butterfly structure. And then the only other thing that I have to do, we don't count the sign change. The only other thing I have to do is an addition there and an addition there. So, I mean, technically it's an addition and a subtraction. Um, so that's why we don't really count the, the, the sign change. So we have one complex multiply per butterfly. We have two complex additions per butterfly. And if you go back and look at our, our layout for the eight point, you'll see that we end up with n over two butterflies per stage. And that's true for any size FFT done this way. And because uh, we ended up with, with 2 to the V is equal to N, and we said that we would have V stages, well, V is just log 2 of N, so we're going to have log 2 N stages. Um, so we've got uh, one complex multiply, two complex adds um, per butterfly, uh, and we have n over 2 butterflies per stage, and we have this many stages per FFT. So just cascading those multiplies together, looking at an analysis of, um, of units. We've got a butterfly canceling with butterfly. We've got stage canceling with stage. And so we end up being able to compute how many complex multiplies per FFT is n over 2 log 2 n. Um, multiplies. And uh, if we do the same kind of thing here, we end up uh, getting n log 2n uh, additions uh, per stage. Now, um, these are kind of just rough, uh, you know, kind of the high, high level uh, accounting. Uh, if you look in uh, some books, they will go into great detail on some tricks that you can take to shave this down a little bit farther. But the bottom line is that um, we end up with something that's order n log n. Um, and so, you know, we may be able to shave down with some, some constants out in front, an alpha and a beta out in front, um, that are less than one, um, but uh, you know those are just um, you know fine tuning. So bottom line is that um, we've demonstrated that the FFT algorithm is uh, is an order n log n um, complexity. So um, we'll finish this set of notes with an example. I'm not going to go through um, all the details on this. I would encourage you to um, do it yourself off on some scrap paper while, while you watch this. Or, well, you know, more likely just turn off the video and just go through the, the notes. Um, but imagine that we have uh, a sequence of X values that are 1 through 8, and they're indexed 0 through 7. So if we do our, our uh, bit reversal, um, we'll see that we get um, 1 and 5 showing up here, we get 3 and 7 showing up here, we get 2 and 6 showing up here, and we get our 4 and our 8 showing up there. Remember, the, these are the values, not the indices. Um, and so our first stage uh, would take these, these first two numbers 
Uh, notice that the twiddle factor in the first stage is all one, so we don't even really have to do anything with that. Um, and then uh, we, we continue on here. Let me get rid of some of this stuff here. Uh, we continue on and we say um, uh, we're going to take uh, a 1. If we go th through this, we're going to take a 1 plus 5 gives us 6. Then we're going to have a 1 minus 5 gives us a negative 4. And you just continue on that way. And so here are the numerical values that come out of that um, first stage. Then we go on next stage. Um, and so these things just carry straight through. Uh, and now we apply our, our twiddle factors. And if you go back and look at how we calculate our twiddle factors here, uh, it's going to be a 1 and a negative j, a 1 and a negative j. The stuff up here is always the same as the stuff down here. Um, and so now we go through our, our process here. Uh, and in fact, we end up with the uh, uh, same kind of thing. So uh, let me just walk you through one of them here. We're going to have uh, a 6 coming along here. And then we're going to have our 10 times a 1, uh, and that gets uh, added to that. So we have 6 plus 10 is equal to 16. Uh, the next one down doesn't come from the red calculations. It comes from the blue calculations. Um, and so we'll, we'll take a, a, a minus 4 uh, coming across here together with a, a minus 4 times a negative j, so we'll have a, a plus j coming up there. So we have a minus 4 plus j. And, and, and we keep going on uh, this way. And what I wanna, one thing I want to point out here is this idea of in-place computations. Um, we'll, we'll talk about this more in the next set of notes. But um, when we set up the FFT this way, the computations can all be done in place, so each butterfly's computations can replace um, what was previously done. Uh, so you know we take this number six uh, and we take the number ten, uh, and and we end up computing the sixteen and the negative four, and that can get stored right back into place. We can put those numbers right, written over the six and ten, leaving everything else untouched in an array of numbers. Um, so the, 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 uh, the, rep the things that got replaced, uh, which, which are here and, and here with, with the X's through them, uh, will never need the original 6 and 10 again. So this is what's known as in-place computation. And you can check all through this structure. Um, once you compute the outputs of a butterfly, you can actually replace them um, uh, in place. So that means that for doing this kind of computation you don't need a large additional amount of, of memory. You only need uh, really two additional working memory locations to, to you know kind of store some intermediate results in computing the butterfly. And then as soon as you've computed the outputs of those butterflies you can write them back over um, the original data. Uh, now, if we go to the lab here, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through any of this here. You can, you can track this through. And what I would encourage you to do is take those, those numbers, 1 through 8, stick them into a vector x, compute the DFT uh, on them. You can use the FFT command um, in, in MATLAB. And uh, don't do the FFT shift. You should get these numbers, 36 minus 4 plus j, 9.6, blah, 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 and, and so on. So these are the numbers that you should see coming out of that MATLAB FFT computation, and you can verify that, yes, indeed, those are the correct numbers. Or you could even compute them, um, you know, directly with a DFT by doing those sums um, in, in, in MATLAB. You could write a little loop that would go and do those sums um, if, if you wanted. All right, so we'll, we'll end there uh, on this set of notes. and the next set of notes, we'll talk about a little more generic uh, or general way of thinking about FFT development. And there's, there's lots and lots of different varieties of FFT algorithms. 
um, that are developed for different settings. And we're not going to go into all the details. My, my hope is to just introduce you to the basic idea. Some of you, you know, even those of you who are going to specialize in DSP, you may not ever have to go in and, and code an FFT algorithm. And, you know, you buy an FPGA uh, development system, they've got the code written for you. You buy a DSP um, processor chip, they've got code written for you. Um, but if you want to specialize in this area, you could go off and work for one of those companies that's developing those um, those products, and you may be the person figuring out how to get all this stuff to work, uh, in which case there are entire books written on the ins and outs, pun intended, uh, of uh, the FFT algorithm uh, and all the, all the details of it. So we'll stop there, and I'll see you in the next set of notes.